This event contains mature themes. Discretion is advised. There's a lot of controversy about how are we to uh, define uh, even serial killer. So there's something called a mass murderer. We hear a lot about those, or have heard a lot about a lot about lo those recently. So school shootings would be a case of um, a mass murder. There's also the spree killer. Uh, the spree killer is sometimes uh, defined also as a serial killer, but is someone who is uh, has a different kind of motive usually, and but who is also. Uh, killing on different occasions um, or locations and occasions uh, and mass murderers and spree killers sometimes are called rampage killers. So the FBI defines uh, a serial killer as someone who has at least uh, committed at least three murderers uh, over at least three years at three different uh, locations and with an emotional cooling off period in between. Now, there are obvious uh, problems with that uh, definition, right? So we could simply stick to that definition, but there are also problems with that. The problem would be, what if uh, a person murders a number of people in the same location? Uh, that doesn't seem to uh, not be a serial killer in that case. Um, and also, there's not a, the motive does not show up here. In fact, the spree killer uh, seems to satisfy the FBI uh, definition. So the National Institute um, has a slightly different um, definition of a serial killer where it's just two or more murders with a psychological motive and sadistic sexual overtones. Uh, so they say it's a type of sex crime. Uh, it might be sort of a monstrous version of normal male sexuality. Uh, that definition might be more in line with the common conception, but even that definition is not perfect because it does not necessarily apply to all serial killers, males, and in only in rare cases does it apply to female uh, serial killers. And there are some female serial killers, even though most are males. Okay, so a couple of uh, other preliminaries here. Um, so when we talk about serial killers and the, the psychology philosophy of um, serial killers or um, psychopath more generally, uh, there are different things that we need to distinguish. So there's a motive. Um, I'll get back to the cause versus a motive, but for now, motive versus the MO versus uh, the signature. So let's look at uh, the MO. So what would the MO be for a... Uh, a serial killer, well, if you are a police officer who is inspecting um, a, a crime scene or several of them, uh, you're looking at what is the victim type, right? Is it um, a certain class like prostitutes? Is it like young college students, males, females? How are the victims approached? What tools are used? What time and place uh, uh, do the murders occur? So that would be sort of the, the MO which is different from the motive. So this is not sort of telling us much about the motive. Um, so the MO is important, of course, for catching the serial killer because you might be able to predict when the next uh, killing is going to take place, or you might be able to PM that. Uh, but the motive, if we can figure it out, uh, gives us more of an insight into the mind of the killer than the MO, typically. There's also something called the signature. Uh, the signature can give us uh, insight into uh, the motive. So here's an example of uh, a, uh, a signature. So there was the um, Boston Strangler um, who was strangling um, um, people over a long period of time. And uh, these women that he was strangling uh, he would place a bow, so he would strangle them with their, usually their, their stockings, and, but he, then he would make a bow, and the bow was his, sort of a signature thing. Um, in, it may or may not be something that reveals anything about the motive. In his case, it could have been because he had a crippled uh, daughter, and uh, he used to tie, so she had to be in a certain kind of... Uh, fixture for her legs, and he used to tie bows on those to make it sort of 
um, more appealing to her. So there might be a connection there, but sometimes it's just idiosyncratic and doesn't give us much. Um, but of course, it is a way that, again, to can help people uh, identify the, uh, the murder. Okay, so here's a uh, Jeffrey Dahmer um, example. This is an example of an MO. So what would the MO be? It would be much more complicated than this, but here's a part of the MO. Uh, the MO would be sort of lying about being a photographer to young boys and men at bars to lure them back to uh, his apartment, ask them to be models at his apartment, and then he would attack them there. So that would be part of his uh, MO. So that's sort of the way that he was operating. Um, well, what is his, uh, his signature? Well, his signature, um, uh, he, in this case, is a little more complex than just a bow. So he was um, having, I mean, it, it was, he was engaging in sex with the bodies. He was also cutting up the victims. Uh, he was also um, sometimes eating part of them and keeping some of them in the refrigerator. So that would be part of the, um, the signature. But it isn't, that does not tell us what his motive was. Um, of course, the motive, the motive is, is, can be really interesting. Um, but in some cases, it's not that interesting. Um, and here's why. In some cases, uh, serial killers, and we'll get back to that, in some cases, serial killers are psychotic, uh, which means that they might have, say, schizophrenia, and if they have schizophrenia, they might be hearing voices. So let's say that someone is hearing voices who is telling that person that that person, that person, that person, and that person uh, are out to kill him. So he thinks in his own mind that he is, is actually killing in self-defense. He's wrong, but, so he's a serial killer, but he, he from his perspective, he's killing in self-defense. So his motive is self-defense. Um, so the motive in that case is not really sort of what we want to know. So the cause and the motive can come apart, right? So in this case, what would the cause be? In this case, the cause would be a mental disorder, schizophrenia, which might have other prior causes uh, that could be genetic or in, in childhood. Okay, so let's look closer at um, gene-related causes. So, so serial killers sort of divide into, uh, well, there are many ways to divide uh, up serial killers, but uh, here's um, one way, and that is between whether they are actually psychotic or whether they suffer from a different kind of disorder. Uh, if they have psychosis, it can include borderline personality disorder, different kinds of um, uh, schizophrenia and psychosis. Uh, as I mentioned, often they will have a kind of paranoia, right? So they, will f they might feel that they are followed or threatened. Um, they uh, might have hallucinations, uh, hearing voices. There's a concept called thought insertion. Thought insertion uh, is something that people who don't have schizophrenia or psychosis don't normally experience. It is when you have your thoughts, your thoughts are, belong to you, you feel that they belong to you. You don't feel that they are the thoughts of somebody outside of you or that the CEI uh, has implanted something in your mind. Thought insertion is when your own thoughts are attributed to something on the outside. Um, and something that's related to that is that when you don't feel you have authority over your own thoughts, or maybe your own feelings or your own desires, you feel that they belong to someone else. Uh, so those concepts are related. One example, uh, this is even a, a bit controversial, one example of um, someone who is at least, according to one definition, a serial killer uh, killed two people, uh, Ed Gein. Um, he was schizof uh, schizophrenic. He was found guilty of the two murders. He also stole bodies from graveyards and so on. And he was the inspiration for the American uh, psycho uh, and was making various things out of human skin, uh, furniture, uh, lamb shells, and, and other things. Um, 
he um, he actually was declared legally insane because it was determined that he could not distinguish right from wrong, and so it was determined that he his disease or underlying disorder was sort of driving his his killings, and they were sort of limited. So this type um, is not typically the one that's really hard to understand. It is um, hard to understand, of course, how people develop these disorders, but if people are hearing voices that are telling them what to do, you can kind of see that if you were hearing voices that were telling you what to do, um, you might be so scared that you're just doing it, right? If you really believe it's real. So it's not as hard to understand how they're acting that way that they do. Then that's the more common one. The more common one is uh, is also, to, to some extent, gene-related. Um, and it's based on what we normally refer to as a psychopath uh, or a sociopath, um, also known as antisocial personality disorder. It can also sometimes be narcissists, misogynists. Um, there can be some other variations on it, uh, but usually antisocial personality disorder. Um, some general characteristics uh, of that kind of type of person is sort of a, a disregard for morals, social norms, um, and the rights and feelings of others. Uh, it's a tendency to exploit others in harmful ways or to just gain pleasure. Um, that can be statist statistic uh, tendencies. Um, they tend to manipulate and deceit others. Uh, and many of them have superficial charm. Occasionally, they will just appear to be uh, intimidating and violent, but in many cases, they have superficial charm. Uh, the evil that they have, is some people in, in the FBI talk about a special kind of evil, is often concealed, uh, and also their murders are more often much more premeditated, so they take place over uh, I mean, the planning of them take place over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, so the murders often are very rational, intelligent, and calm murders. They're also the types of persons who will tend to clean up after themselves. Uh, and so they're harder to catch than the psychotic, typically. Harder to catch than the psychotic killers. Um, and and um, they, they're... Um, so because they're deceitful, they are also hard to detect. So in the case of uh, Ted Bundy that we'll get to uh, next, it actually turned out that even after they had a, a pretty realistic um, profiling of him and um, a, a photo, sort of a photo generated, um, computer generated photo of him, even his girlfriend, uh, would not believe, would sim simply not believe that he was the one, um, even though everything was uh, point on in terms of the car he was driving, uh, his MO, uh, what he looked like, but uh, both his co-workers, his girlfriend, and so on, they failed to believe that it was him because of his superficial charm. So he, so Ted Bundy is sort of the, uh, stereotypical, now stereotypical case of the person with antisocial personality disorder, uh, a, psych a real psychopath. And he was also the one that got the concept of serial killer to sort of be materialized in our minds, uh, much more than anyone else. Of course, so it's always Jack the River, but uh, the next one after him that had uh, a lot, or got a lot of media attention uh, was, was Ted. Uh, Bundy. And it was around the time of Ted Bundy that the, the word serial killer even entered uh, the literature. So it's a fairly new concept, um, even though serial killers have existed um, to some extent throughout the history. But the concept of a serial killer became public with uh, Ted Bundy. What is uh, interesting about him and other people in that category is that they tend to be highly intelligent. Um, some of them have average intelligence, but some of them have very high intelligence, which can help them hide from the police and disguise their 
their actions and evade uh, being caught for a very long time. Ted Bundy it has a long history of having done really, really well and then really, really poorly. Uh, but uh, he was uh, a university student, a law student at some point. Uh, he was also at an, another point a psychology student where he got some very, very nice letters of recommendation from his advisors uh, that they were praising his brilliance uh, as a psychologist. And he was active in politics, so he was actually uh, uh, he was playing a role in uh, some campaigns for Republican um, people on various occasions. Um, now, so before Bondi, it was commonly assumed that these lust killers, which was another name for a serial killer, that they were always psychotic. But it turns out that uh, Ted Bundy was not psychotic. I mean, there's a sense in which, of course, he was there was something wrong with him. Uh, if you think about some of the h horrible acts that he committed, all the murders he committed, of course something is wrong with him. But he is not actually psychotic. Uh, and it's not clear that he has, well, it's clear that he has a personality disorder but it's not clear that he has a sort of a, a psychotic disorder of any kind. Uh, and also, for long periods of time, he was struggling to uh, be one of us. And he kept appearing to be one of us, right? So his coworkers didn't believe that he would ever be capable of doing what he did. Um, and he was also coming back so he was every time he had like an attempted murder before he committed his first murders, um, he was struggling to get back on track and actually held important jobs uh, and was actually um, going to school and so on. Um, though in some cases he failed um, in in school and that coincided with certain other events uh, in his life. Okay, now, so psychopaths are actually widespread. So psychopaths are not always serial killers. So just because you or me or someone you know is a psychopath, that doesn't mean that uh, you are a serial killer. So a lot of people who have uh, antisocial personality disorder or some related disorder, they end up being the mean boss or the mean uh, successful CEO uh, who can read people really well, who might be using slightly sort of manipulative methods. Um, some other uh, people with that disorder become important painters or writers. Um, and so it clearly is not just that genetic factor, even if, if the personality disorder to some extent is genetic, it's, it cannot explain, um, it cannot ex actually give the full cause of, um, of why someone becomes a serial killer. Um, so one factor that may be important is early uh, childhood uh, abuse uh, or maltreatment, uh, or it can also be later failure. So uh, a, a one case of psychological abuse was uh, Ed Kemper. He had a very uh, domineering mother, belittled by mother. Um, so that would be an example of psychological abuse. Uh, sexual abuse is found in many cases in their childhood. Other forms of physical abuse, but also traumatic events. Uh, and that could even be a lack of infant bonding so there's something called attachment theory, and if a baby that fails to attach to the mother and or father early on in, in well, during uh, the stage of being an infant, uh, then that can lead to problems later on. So uh, at least some people think that it's a combination of the genetic factors, so a predisposition to have this uh, antisocial personality disorder, plus some kinds of events that take place in either very early childhood or in, early in childhood, 
Um, or maybe later, it could also be later failure. So later failure can be so devastating to some people who have these tendencies that that can lead them to uh, commit uh, these crimes. We'll look at some other uh, factors as well. But let me go into um, some of the, um, the, the chemistry uh, underlying serial killing. So this is uh, some of the stuff that we are looking into. And, and also um, a, a little bit about brain structure, which uh, seems to have an effect. And we don't know, of course, whether these disturbances in the chemicals or in the brain structure, whether those are genetic or, or caused by cultural event. It could be both. Um, but it seems that, um, that little kids who uh, undergo traumatic events whether it's abuse or it's, it could be an important loss of a family member, uh, that there is a certain disruption to the development of the central nervous system. Uh, in some cases, that can lead to too much dopamine and serotonin in the brain. Um, and too much serotonin, uh, it, well, if you have heard of antidepressants, you know that uh, people with uh, depression and uh, anxiety often have too low levels of serotonin. But it's not the more the better. So there are also cases where you actually have too much dopamine, too much serotonin, uh, which can lead to certain forms of aggressions and uh, anger. Um, another um, promising factor, promising in terms of maybe potential treatments as we'll look at, uh, is uh, too high testosterone levels. So one um, piece of evidence uh, for that, so, so that's, that can be that associated with aggression, but it can also be associated with, um, of course, like a, an intense sex drive of sorts. Um, and we'll look at, um, at later how that might be, um, lead to a form of, of treatment. Um, but too high uh, testosterone levels, one, one piece of evidence that, that can lead to that is that there are some um, elderly men who undergo testosterone treatment where they get uh, testosterone injections because they have problems with low levels of testosterone. And there have recently been some cases uh, where I'm an expert uh, witness of people who have committed uh, some crimes, not serial killing, but committed crimes that were sex-related crimes uh, after undergoing testosterone treatment. So there seems to be a connection between uh, too high levels or a certain level of testosterone and a certain, uh, certain kinds of sex crimes. Okay, here's another thing that we're looking at with respect to um, psychopath. Um, so one hypothesis is that we have a kind of dopamine dysregulation. Now, all addiction involves a kind of dopamine um, dysregulation. One hypothesis is that, so dopamine is what drives us. It's also a pleasure chemical. And in some cases, we don't have enough receptors. Those are sort of the, uh, the keyholes for the key, if we take dopamine to be the key. So the keyholes in, in the brain, um, the, we don't have enough of those. Um, if we don't have enough of those, then little things that would excite me or you, they don't excite these people. Uh, so I might be excited if I go see one of my favorite movies, uh, or if I visit the library here, I might, that might bring me excitement. But for them, that wouldn't give them enough excitement because they don't have so the dopamine is required to create that pleasure feeling, excitement, so because they don't have enough receptors in the brain, they need more stimulation in order to create the same effect. So that's when you get into perhaps drug addiction, or gambling addiction, or shopping addiction. Um, and it seems that in, in some of these cases, it is a kind of addiction to a kind of a particular violence in the case of serial killers. Um, and very often, we also see addiction to other things prior, 
to uh, the act the actual killings taking place. So in many cases, there is uh, an addiction to alcohol or drugs or sex. Um, there's another kind of um, addiction. It's not quite an uh, addiction, but more an obsession. But obsession is actually uh, grounded in a in a way that's similar to addiction. And a lot of serial killers, including Jeff Dahmer and Ted Bundy, have had an obsession with sort of the upper class or the upper middle class uh, because they were born in very poor environments and somehow they were seeing themselves maybe to, together with some element of narcissism. They were seeing themselves as being better than that poor environment. And so they were actually very envious of people who had it better than them. And uh, Ted Bundy, in particular, seemed to be um, that seemed to be his goal all along. So it seemed to be his goal was to get to that upper middle class, something like that. So through his political uh, connections, he got in, uh, in touch with influential people, and he also uh, his the love of his life uh, was from a, an a upper class family. So he always sort of striving in that way, and it that again has to do with that uh, he f the feeling of loss of power that he um, set himself in interviews after he got caught, that he felt like a loss of power, embarrassment from being from a lower class, um, and when everything else failed, then the killings became the thing that he could undertake, where he could actually. Um, exert that power and gain that power that he had always been striving for. Okay, here's some. Uh, um, this is a mix of some signs, uh, exposure, early indicators. So, when you have a phobia, so you could have a phobia of a snake, or snakes in general, or spiders, and let's say you want to get cured for that phobia. And you go to a cognitive behavioral therapist and say, I want to get cured of my phobia of spiders. One common approach is called exposure theory. Exposure theory would be something like this. Um, let's say it's spiders, then, uh, well, first maybe you're shown some pictures of spiders. When you get like com comfortable enough with that, you might be shown some spiders in an aquarium. Uh, and then you might be shown a spider that's out in front of you, uh, and then you might be asked to touch the spider or hold the spider or something like that. And this exposure theory is supposed to cure your, your fear of, of uh, spiders in this case. Now, how does that work? Well, it's desensitizing the brain. And it's believed that a lot of things can desensitize the brain. So a lot of serial killers, they don't start out by killing. Um, they start out in other ways. Uh, so in some cases, they, they experiment even with just with dolls. So Jeff Dahmer would cut off the arms and legs of the Barbie dolls of his sister. Um, Bundy was uh, engaging in some kind of theft, various theft in order to get just clothes, not to sell it. So he was not a professional uh, burglar or thief. But uh, just for himself, he would uh, acquire clothes uh, through uh, theft and uh, burglary in order to get furniture and so on for his apartment. Um, there's also um, violent porn exposure is another thing that is common. So it's not to say that violent porn by itself can cause you to become a serial killer, but more something that can actually facilitate it if you have the predisposition to do it. Um, there's also another common factor so that serial killers have in common is that they're very often uh, feeling isolated and inferior to others during adolescence. So many of them might be very popular in when they're younger, but then during adolescence they feel very isolated, they tend not to have many friends, and some of them actually drop out of school or or do poorly in school at that point. Um, and there's also uh, the the uh, the fantasies, I see that it's cut off a little bit there, um, but early uh, sexual fantasies uh, seem to be something that um, that 
serial killers have in common that might also desensitize them to later killings. Um, pyromania is, is a sign. Uh, again, maybe it's related to theft. It's sort of dangerous. You can see how it could provoke that dopamine rush um, in some people who can't get it otherwise. The bedwetting is, is, um, is a sign that we don't fully know, we don't fully know what, why that is, the bedwetting, but it's, it tends to be uh, something that we see like in, um, in something like 30% of, of serial killers uh, have had bedwetting into adolescence. So this is sort of like, why, why do they have that? And that may of course be related to a certain kind of anxiety and early childhood stress uh, that uh, has caused that. Okay, so let's look at some, um, uh, some differences in the brain. There are lots of uh, descriptions of differences in the brain, um, but one hypothesis that we are working on, uh, looking at, uh, is that, so when we process negative emotions, we use a part of the brain that's called the amygdala. You can see it in the picture up there. It's a little, little uh, tiny part of the bigger blue part, which is the memory center. And the amygdala is processing negative emotions, but you can't just have the amygdala process negative em emotions and then feel them. In fact, you need a part of the prefrontal cortex uh, that's called the VM prefrontal cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. You need that in order to interpret your emotions. Now, there are two kinds of things, uh, causes of a disruption of that process. So in, in certain scans, we've seen a disruption of uh, the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, which would mean that, uh, that the serial killers could be very stressed out and have a lot of underlying anxiety, but they can't actually interpret it, understand it, maybe not even feel it, and the, hence the lack of empathy. Um, in, um, in other cases, uh, this is more rare. There are direct lesions to uh, that part of the prefrontal cortex, which of course would also prevent uh, you from interpreting your emotions correctly. So those can be some, again, we don't know whether that uh, is, is genetic or whether that can be caused during development, um, during childhood, for example. So here's the uh, really interesting uh, part, uh, in my opinion. Um, and that is that there's been a rise in serial killings um, after 1800 and even more so after uh, around 1900. Now the numbers have been extremely exaggerated in the, in the media for political reasons because uh, there were some political reasons where they wanted, where certain bureaus wanted an upgrade of, of their systems. Um, and so they're accelerating the numbers. But as when you look at the, the numbers that are adjusted to a more realistic uh, account, and you also look at the so historians who have been tried to investigate any reports of serial killings prior to 1800, um, you don't, Really, you don't really find a lot of um, sex-based uh, serial killings. Uh, so, why I'm saying sex-based serial killings because a lot of uh, these serial killers do have this sexual motive. Uh, and by sexual motive, again, it does not have to be sex per se, but it can be like a sexual arousal associated with cutting um, or stabbing. Uh, or, or uh, even like uh, just setting a house on fire or a person on fire. So, so there is sort of a, usually a sexual element, at least when it's male serial killers, uh, and that is rare. It's not, it, it has occurred before, has occurred before uh, 1800, but it's much, much rarer before 1800. And again, it's, um, it's a lot, it, it, there was just an increase in these kinds of killings. So there's other kinds of serial killings, of course, that have been taking place, right, uh, throughout history. Um, but, but it seems that these particular kind of uh, s sexually based serial killings, that they have been a very a relatively new phenomenon. 
So there's a lot of speculation and, and we don't really know fully what it is that potentially could lead to that. I mean, so there are some people uh, who think that it has to do with the heavy coverage by media. Uh, because the heavy coverage by media, of course, can inspire people uh, to do something similar. Um, portrayal in, in movies, right? Uh, the fact that the syndication of content such that we know about serial killers in the most rural areas uh, of the country or the world, we, c we can find out about those because the syndication of, of content, right, television, radio, uh, and now the internet. And so it could be that that is inspiring um, other people to commit similar kinds of crimes. It doesn't quite explain it though. Um, there's also a tendency to, to have a certain kind of attraction to, uh, to serial killers. So a lot of people are fascinated by serial killers. Um, and in some cases, they're even considered heroes. So even by people who would never hurt uh, another person, there are people who are fascinated with serial killers and who um, find them kind of, in some sense, heroes. Um, there can be two kinds. There can be people like uh, Ted Bundy. So even though he was raping and murdering uh, young college students, um, he, he was quite clever, so he was not caught by the police for a very, very long time. And some people have an admiration for, for that kind of um, what you might call extraordinary evil talent or something like that, um, evading the, the police. Then there's another kind of uh, type of person who will consider some of these serial killers heroes. So there are different target groups of different serial killers. And in some cases, they go after um, what some people would call lower class individuals. A lower class, uh, I don't mean socioeconomic, um, or maybe social, but not economic lower class necessarily, but prostitutes, right? So a lot of serial killers have gone after prostitutes. And some people find that, uh, to some extent, admirable because um, they have a low or have low thoughts about uh, or of the, the prostitutes and think that, well, they're actually doing them a favor. They're doing society a favor by, by killing uh, the, the prostitutes. So there is also that tendency. Then there's uh, another uh, thing that, uh, again, uh, n none of this can, of course, explain um, why s serial killing occurs or starts out. Um, but there's, in um, modern society, a greater opportunity uh, to commit uh, these kinds of crimes. And one reason for that is the greater um, leisure time. So if you go back to 1700, for example, it would have to be, you would have to be really upper class to have a lot of leisure time. Um, because you would have to have a lot of servants and um, if you were an ordinary worker, you would ha you'd, you'd be too busy to think about these things. Even if you had the tendency, presumably, you would be so occupied to even just get food on the table uh, that you would not actually act out on, on these um, fantasies. Um, that, um, that leads us to something that Emily Dickinson uh, actually noticed. She wasn't talking about a serial killers per, per se, but murder and, um, and other kinds of horror, horrific things that people could do to each other. And that was what I mentioned before. There's a, a fascination with it. Um, not everyone is fascinated, but there's a general fascination with uh, horror, uh, horror and especially in true crime and so on. And one thing she noticed, she didn't say, talk about serial killers per se, but we could carry it over to serial killers, is that the serial killers overstep the boundaries between uh, fantasy um, or fascination and reality. So these other factors that I mentioned can make a person actually take these fantasies or this fascination and actually go into carrying out these crimes um, and, and, and um, and actually start to kill people. Um, it should be mentioned that it's, it's, um, 
for most serial killers who have been interviewed, most serial killers do not find it easy to kill the first time. So that's, uh, again, the thing about desensitizing the brain, that the first killing for them is, is actually very, very difficult in most cases. Um, but so there's a, a sort of, but, but at some point they overstep the boundary of their fantasies or their fascination and actually commit the act itself. Okay, so I'm going to leave some time for Q&A. So this is going to be uh, the, the last uh, slide for today. Um, potential treatments. Well, there's been a lot of um, work on early intervention. Um, so psychiatric um, treatments and so on. Now, they are really hard to carry out when you have a case of a person with narcissism or anti-social personality disorder because they're deceitful. So they are even capable and they're clever. So they're capable of deceiving their psychiatrist. So a lot of people have actually been let out where they, the psychiatrist is saying, oh, they, there's no chance that they will ever commit a crime again. And then they, um, they go out and they start killing people again. So the early intervention probably would have to be much, much earlier. Um, so probably um, in, in early childhood, where often there has not been intervention when you have seen these tendencies to start experimenting with animals or, or dolls early on. Um, then there's uh, the atypical, I'm saying atypical antipsychotics uh, because um, they don't just down-regulate, they down-regulate the, the high dopamine level, but they don't down-regulate them so much that there, other, there can be other serious side effects of, of um, if, if you have the uh, traditional antipsychotic medications, you might down-regulate dopamine so much that you actually get some other serious uh, mental disorders uh, from that. So the atypical ones are sort of keeping it in check. That sometimes can it sometimes can help. Uh, again, it's not uh, probably not the most successful way of of treating um, psychopathy uh, or or um, treating serial killers. Um, medications that lower testosterone seem to have hold more promise because it does seem to, uh, that a lot of, of serial killers are driven by two high levels of testosterone, of course, in combination with other factors. Um, for instance, opportunity and certain harmful uh, events in childhood and so on. So by downloading uh, testosterone, uh, there's less of a sex drive. And again, the sex drive doesn't have to be directed towards the standard way we are thinking about sex. So it doesn't have to be uh, directed towards um, sex in an ordinary sense. It could be sexual, getting sexual pleasure from starting a fire or from stabbing a person. Um, but that's driven by testosterone to a large extent. So medications that lower testosterone levels uh, hold a lot of promise. There's been throughout the 60s that was uh, exposure to psychedelic drugs. It did not work, but they used LSD. And today we actually have psychedelic drugs uh, that we are investigating um, that are much more targeted. And uh, they do hold some um, promise for personality changes. And so that's uh, potentially also a, a, a future treatment. They're not legal right now, but we, we use them in research. And then uh, a, a, another thing we're looking at is um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's really, uh, a, it sounds, it sounds uh, harmful, but it's not a very harmful procedure. Uh, it's used also for people who are depressed and people who have anxiety. Uh, it's used for many other purposes as well. But it seems that uh, by stimulating the prefrontal cortex that you can sometimes sort of jumpstart the brain when I said that that connection between the prefrontal cortex and that area, the amygdala that processes fear, that that is disrupted. You can sometimes sort of um, start the or jumpstart the brain again by using this uh, this method. So these are some potential uh, treatments um, that could maybe be used early on and so that we could avoid, maybe even avoid uh, any killings to begin with. All right, thanks for listening. <laughs>